So welcome to a very special event of uh, UX Greece community. I'm Ioannis Veneris and with me, Dimitris Stathis, uh, Dimitris Niafis and uh, Nikos Papas. Nice seeing you again. N nice meeting you for all of you that this is your first time uh, in UX Greece community. Uh, just a few minutes for a, a very brief intro for uh, our new friends. Uh, UX community, oh, I messed up with the with a slide, sorry for that. Uh, UX Greece community serves as a hub for UX and product design professionals. We organize uh, gatherings uh, almost every quarter, bringing in worldwide experts to dive into specific UX subjects. Uh, your participation and your questions fuel these sessions, so don't hesitate to engage. This is why we're here uh, today and why we uh, do those uh, meetups. Uh, if you are here because you just stumbled upon a post about Jacob Nielsen being on an event, be sure to follow us on uh, to follow our LinkedIn group uh, to keep up with all the uh, all future gatherings. Uh, you can also check our YouTube channel for all the recording of the past events. And now we uh, have a dedicated website as well, and you are all invited to join at uh, uxgreece.community. We're going to drop the links in the chat uh, shortly. Now, uh, a huge thanks to our sponsor from Scratch Studio, Zansi Labs, the UX Prodigy, and uh, Evidence Based. Their support extends beyond just uh, our events, but also includes offering exciting books for giveaways. It's time. Uh, here's what you need to do to win. Post on LinkedIn, share a, a key takeaway from today's event with your network, pose a question, or just say hi. Use the tags, uh, the hashtags UX and UX Greece in your post. You have five hours from now to post. We will gather all the posts, choose winners at random, and uh, contact them directly on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, now, as I said, uh, it is a very special moment for our community, as today we have with us Mr. Jacob Nielsen. Uh, I have no words. I have too many words and no words at the same time. I'm like in a limbo state. So, Dimitris, uh, could you please give a proper introduction and kick off with our first topic? Yes. So, for those of you that don't know Jacob Nielsen, how dare you? But Jacob Nielsen... Uh, has been a usability pioneer for 41 years, like most years than more years than most of us are alive, right? Uh, he has founded the Digital Usability Movement, which is an exception of two, uh, for fast and cheap iterative design, including heuristic evaluation. Again, he has also founded, uh, created the 10 usability heuristics. Interesting topic here. Uh, he has formulated the eponymous Jacob's Law for the Internet User Experience. Great stuff. Uh, Jacob has uh, was named King of Usability by the Internet Magazine, Guru of Web Page Usability by New York Times, and the best, the next best thing to a true time machine by USA Today. Amazing titles. Also, uh, last week was it? Uh, she was named. Uh, she got. She received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Human Computer Interaction Practice from the ACM uh, Sikai, and he was named Titan of Human Factors by the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. Jacob, welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you everybody for coming and from very different time zones I noticed in the chat, so that's great. Uh, amazing to have you here. We had many, many questions uh, from our community. Um, but one of the things that we had to ask you, like we, we had this topic, is about Jacob's heuristics, right? I think it's closing to 30 years now, right? And throughout these years, we've continually seen uh, both minor and major advancements in technology and shift uh, in user behavior. Uh, new technologies are majorly changing the field. Uh, so how do you feel about the future? Uh, do they need Jacob's sweet thoughts to continue being useful? Yeah, well, I think so. And I think that it's actually it's exactly 30 years uh, this year because the version of the heuristics that's the current one, I uh, actually defined that back in um, in 94, uh, based on you know a variety of work. And I'm going to actually be writing an article for my newsletter uh, come out on UX Tigers on, on Substack shortly, but about how this was derived. But it was derived by analyzing a number of user interfaces and usability problems we had seen in user testing back then. And it's very true that the user interfaces we had in 94 are not the user interfaces that we have today. But 
the point about heuristics are they are very broad general principles. That was the entire idea why there are only 10, because there are really thousands of things to know about user interface design. Uh, and my thought was that's on the one hand very good to know all that, but it's also too much to assume or expect people to remember constantly. So I want to have a smaller list that people could keep more in mind and use as a quick checklist to think about uh, user interfaces. And so because of that, they are extremely broad in general, and they actually really uh, relate more to the general problem of bridging the gap between computers and humans, not so much about specific screen designs or specific audio designs, if you're designing an audio interface. I mean, they actually apply, whether it's a visual design or an audio, audio design, they still apply. Uh, even though like the phrasing, like one of the heuristics is called visibility of system status. And so if you have an audio only design, you can't have it be literally visible, but you have to make it apparent or known, I guess would be like, you would have to rephrase or rethink about it in that case. But no, they, they I think they apply and they've applied for 30 years, they're still useful today. And so to me, I have this general view of history, which is that if you look back a number of years and something has been true for a very long time, you can flip and you can look forward and you can expect that it will probably continue to remain true in the future as well if it's been true for a long time in the past. And so that's why I, I expect that these 10 heuristics will still be useful for analyzing or talking about user interface design with whatever turns out to be the next technology uh, in the future, uh, because they're not actually uh, precise enough. They're broad enough, but they're not precise enough to relate really to the specifics of the technology. So like, whether you're designing a mobile design, well, okay, we have various issues that relate to the, to the screen being small, and that's not directly covered by the heuristics, but the general points about the dialogue or the interaction they are covered whether you're talking about a small screen or a big screen, or in the old days, you were talking about a, a text-based, you know, Unix-based user interface, or you're talking about a graphical user interface, or you're talking about artificial intelligence-driven user interface. All of those things are really kind of subsumed under that higher level of very broad thinking of the heuristics. And I feel like that's very useful. It's also very useful to have very specific guidelines for the exact technology. I mean, both are, are useful, but they're just different types of thinking about user interface design. Amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that, like the different uh, interfaces we have, uh, and uh, I would like to dive into the uh, the third paradigm uh, of user interface, uh, those uh, new AI tools. Uh, last year, you, you noted that generative uh, AI tools user interface have deep rooted usability problems. Uh, but uh, we see like a new UI paradigm, uh, the so-called intent-based outcome specification uh, yes. that holds, you said that it holds much promise uh, for the future. Uh, so uh, you said that uh, I'm envisioning a future where interfaces would become more hybrid, incorporating the second UI paradigm uh, in a less dominant role uh, and the third. Now, a year on, uh, this was last year, 2023, a year on with various AI tools uh, implementation emerging, do you still foresee a hybrid user interface uh, as the way forward or has your perspective changed uh, from what we knew last year? Right, right. No, I think that prediction actually uh, is, is being fulfilled now. Uh, the hybrid user interface really is very superior. And there are a few examples that are coming out now. So Midjourney, for example, which is probably the number one image generation tool, they have an absolute terrible user interface that was their standard user interface and still is actually, if you just sign up for it, you're gonna get that. And that has so many usability problems and we can spend the rest of the session talking about how bad Midjourney is, except it generates beautiful images, which is why people use it. But they have recognized this and they are now in, um, they call it alpha testing, but it's sort of like a limited release of exactly a hybrid user interface. So they have sliders, for example, for controlling the different parameters. And let me just tell you one of the usability problems. So these parameters, different things you can specify. This is one of the reasons people like it. You have a lot of control over it. There are many things you can specify, but they all have different ranges. So some range from one to a hundred, some range from one to a thousand, some range from one to 3000. Absolutely stupid. I mean, you don't even have to be a user interface genius just have to have like studied UX for like two hours to say that 
you know, people cannot remember these ranges and you have to specify them by a command language like it was, oh, DOS, you know, so this is terrible. Okay, go to their new graphical user interface, which is only in alpha. You can't get at it actually unless you are in a smaller group of kind of elite users. But um, I happen to, to be just, just past that 5,000 images generated in a mid, mid journey. So um, they have sliders. And so the slider is whatever long it is. And then you can slide on that slider. Say, I want it to be in the low end. I want it to be in the high end. You don't have to remember anymore where the high end is 100 or 1,000 or 3,000. So that right there makes it very easy. And you can just look in the view and see how you have specified all the different options. And um, you can magnify an image by clicking on it, which is honestly the only way to magnify an image is to click on it. I mean, clicking on a different button that says upscale image two is stupid. <laughs> so, uh, which is what you have to do in their main user interface right now. So to their credit, right, they are now a year later, maybe two years later, uh, I don't even really know when it launched, but they're now finally getting to this point of making a user interface the way it should have been done from the beginning, but you no know, better late than ever. And so this is really nice. Another example of the hybrid user interface is Google's new image generation tool, ImageFX. Um, they have a lot of pull down menus and ways in which you can modify the prompt. It's still based on explaining to the AI what you want the picture to show. But, and, and that leads to what I call the articulation barrier, which is you have to think up um, ways of putting in words what you want. And most people are not very good at that. Uh, I mean, the people on, on the call today are probably above average in verbal skills because that tends to be who go into UX is people are good at um, explaining things but the average user population is not. And even us, I mean, do you know the names of all possible artistic styles and like how to specify whether something should, should be an expressionist painting or, or you know, some other style? But, so that's the articulation barrier. You have to articulate what you want in the prompts and that's a, that's a usability problem. But what Google has, is doing now is they're showing you a, a pop-up menu with typically, I think, typically four choices, but you could imagine that could be more or less depending on circumstances. But right now, I think they're typically doing four choices of kind of like uh, alternative things you might want to do. So for example, for, for my, my email newsletter to kind of announce I was doing this session, I said, what am I going to have a picture to kind of symbolize you know, Greece. I said, okay, well, a Greek temple is a classic picture. So I, I just had a nice picture made of that. Um, and but then they have this drop down and you say, well, do you want to have it? So I asked for a Greek temple, but you could also have a Roman temple or a Hindu temple or other temples. So if you cannot think about what type of temples are possible, for my pur purpose, you know, it had to be a Greek temple, but for me, maybe other purposes, you just want a type of temple and maybe another type would look more interesting for your purpose. And so if rather than having to think up, these types of temples that give you a menu of them, right? So that goes back to one of the famous heuristics again, um, uh, recognition rather than recall. So when you see the menu of things you can recall, or, oh yeah, I know that the Romans also had classical temples. And so maybe that's what I'd rather show. Um, so this hybrid user interface, it's coming. It's coming, I think, too slowly. They still don't have it really well in let's say chat GPT. They still don't have great ways of, managing your history. So if you are engaging in, in more than just a very simple interaction, if you're engaging in more like a true work product and really creating something more complicated, you go back and forth uh, with it and you do a lot of things and you manipulate and ask it to manipulate the output as well. And all of those specifications are very awkward. You have to say, um, you know, change the third paragraph. You can again, like just click on it. I mean, and, and history, history management is terrible, terrible. And again, we know this from traditional uh, productivity tools that allowing people to manage what they've already done and, and not just have a long, long scrolling list of it. Those are ways in which to improve the usability and they're not quite doing that yet. But those are things I would, so it's already happening. That's my first conclusion is what I predicted last year or called for last year is that we need this. Now it's actually happening in some of the tools, not in all of the tools. So 
Am I going to predict another thing? Well, yes. Next for the upcoming year, for, for the current year of 24, I would think many more tools are going to get these type of hybrid user interfaces because the pure prompting is not, doesn't have high usability. It's a great ability because it leads to this intent-based outcome specification. I can tell the computer what I want to achieve as opposed to the individual steps, right? So that was the old school command-based interaction. I tell that each step I have to specify the command and the computer will execute that command. Give me the feedback back. If it follows good design practice, it gives, it gives you feedback and then you give the next command. But what's better is intent-based outcome specification. You just tell it what you want the goal to be. So that's great. So we want to retain that new capability but we also want to retain the best of the old design. And, and I think we're seeing that happening now. Great, thanks a lot. Nice. Uh, I, I want to ask a, a question. It feels like we're moving towards really fast uh, to a fourth UI paradigm that uh, involves um, augmented reality, AR, and artificial intelligence. So we're seeing the baby steps, uh, this coming together, right? So what do you feel about this uh, coming together and uh, how would this impact UX and usability in the future? Right, well, to start with, with the last part of the question, there's certainly, an, um, it'll be probably more difficult to do usability studies when uh, you really have a three-dimensional space you're studying or that you are immersing the user in because then you have to actually either prototype that, which is again, a harder type of prototyping than prototyping a flat screen, or you have to be with the user as they're moving around the environment. And, and you can do that, of course, you can track the trail the user and, and, and see what they're doing as they're moving around. Or if they're you know, a mechanic repairing an engine, you have to watch them repair that engine. I mean, that's how it is. And if it's an airplane that's being repaired, you have to follow this mechanic around the airplane as they're trying to figure out what's wrong and trying to repair it. So. Uh, that really goes back to the old school definition of, of usability and usability st studies and research, which is we want to study representative users performing representative tasks. And if the tasks become more in the world, more three-dimensional, then that's what we have to study. It just becomes more difficult. It maybe becomes something we cannot do as easily with this type of video technology we're using this meeting today, which has been very, very easy for studying screen-based user interfaces the last few years because of the remote uh, testing platforms. So some of that may may become more difficult. But going to the first part of your question, uh, which is how much do I really believe in all these augmented reality user interfaces? And I actually believe in them a little bit less than the current hype. And I did write an article actually for UX Tigers um, like half a year ago or so, which is comparing the hype for things like the Apple Vision or in general, the uh, the helmets and the, the goggles and the augmented reality on the one hand and artificial intelligence on the other hand, because both are very hyped up in the press. And so to me, the distinction between the two is I believe AI is actually real and therefore it's not hype. Specific claims may be hype, but the general point is not hype. The reason for that is we have a lot of empirical studies now that show productivity gains typically averaging around 40%, four zero percent This is huge in quantitative usability to have that big a lift. And sometimes it's more than 100%. Sometimes it's more like in the order of 20%. So it varies depending on what you're studying. But a lot of things have been actually measured with control groups and all of that stuff. And we know that's a big, big improvement. This is with the current tools, which as I mentioned before, are rather primitive in usability. So even with the current AI tools, we have huge lift in actual workplace productivity for people performing real business tasks. On the other hand, for the AI, for the, sorry, AR, augmented reality uh, products, we mainly have cool demos. We don't really have actual business use. We don't really have controlled human factors experiments where people are trying to perform the task in the old school way and with the new technology and the new technology wins by enough to pay those several thousands of dollars for the technology. So we do not have that for augmented reality. We do have it for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is also cheaper. Ha, well, it's actually cost billions of dollars to create these large language models. 
but it um, is very cheap on an individual user basis. So I actually upgraded my Midjourney subscription because I use it so much, and so I'm paying five hundred dollars a year for Midjourney. So that's but that's kind of like on the high end. Most of the AI tools cost more on the order of, of $20 a month, so $250 a year, something like that. So if they can help you improve your productivity by a big chunk, which they can, then the return on investment is huge for paying that amount of money. So they're relatively cheap compared to what you get. For the augmented reality, it's the opposite. They're rather expensive on a per user basis, which is what, what counts. So per user, they're pretty expensive. And what you gain, well, you gain certain things. I mean, they're absolutely, I can, there's many, many applications that I can envision being good. The most compelling one I've actually seen is to watch movies while you're on an airplane because you can have like this virtually huge screen, even if you're sitting in a tiny, tiny cramped airplane seat. So that's completely a killer app, whether you want to pay whatever it's $3,500 to watch the movie on a bigger screen than just on your tablet. That I don't know how many people will pay that, but it's certainly something that would be an improvement. Uh, I also see a lot of improvements for a lot of tasks that do relate to these, the physical world. So anything from airplane engine repairs to uh, surgeons, you know, trying to operate on a patient or planning to operate on a patient maybe, and looking at these 3D scans of where the, 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 the things wrong in the body. Uh, that's, they all sound very good. But what I want to see now are the human factors experiments that say that if we give a surgeon these goggles, you know, 10% more patients survive the surgery, or it's done in half the time. I mean, it can either be a you know, better outcome or it can be, be faster. Either one would be a big business win. Uh, and that we don't have. It, only, it sounds cool. We don't actually know if it truly improves task performance. I see. Uh, thank you That's... for your answer. That's a great answer. Uh, I would like to take us back, you know, a little bit to now, because we've been talking a bit about the future, May. And, uh, you know, people have been skipping research for years. And uh, now that there are there are tools that uh, promise to simulate doing research with people, but without actually talking to people. So there is a danger of performing research just with AI. Uh, you know, in order to just uh, check that research box. Uh, what would you suggest to people battling this uh, AI-powered research theater, if we yeah. call it? Yeah, that? yeah. I think your, your phrase is quite appropriate because it's more research theater than it's actually research. It's more checking the box of performance than it's 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 reality. I, I think, honestly, there's a lot of benefit from AI and user experience work, but uh, substituting for user research is not one of them. Uh, because you do user research to exactly observe what real people do, which is always surprising. And you know, one of my sayings is that if you do a, a user research study, a user testing, or any of the various methodologies, and you don't do not get any surprises, that shows you ran the study wrong. It doesn't does not show that there are no surprises in the world. It shows that you didn't you know, research them right. Because anytime you actually do do a study right you will always find something you did not expect to find. That's kind of, and even with only five users, you will always find something interesting new uh, because people are so unpredictable and there's always something weird in what they do. And, and uh, also a lot of, of designs are very domain specific, very task specific, and they relate a lot to how people do perform that particular task or also how they feel about a desire in that particular space, which again are things that we would not know in general uh, without watching them. And so I do not think that, that, that AI can substitute for that with like artificial or pretend users. I do think AI can do a lot of other things. Um, for example, in, in, in design, you no, know, we can create, ideation is free is one of my, my slogans about AI because it just generates 10 ideas or 20 ideas or 50 ideas. So the limit is actually uh, your time. Like you gotta look at all these ideas and select the ones to use. And that takes a little time. Quite often you can reject a lot of bad ones very, very quickly. And on the other hand, there are some good ones that you can then refine maybe by, by human design work. But um, you can get a lot of design ideas. AI is really great at giving you sometimes the unexpected 
which is often bad and sometimes good, right? And and it, again, it just drives you out of your comfort zone by coming up with other ways of approaching the problem. And if you always ask, you don't ask AI, give me a solution to this problem. You ask AI to give me 10 solutions or 20 solutions. And then you, you and this is where you have the human, the human then selects the more appropriate ones, and then you pass those on. And then you have to do that type of research as well uh, to find out what actually works with your actual customers who are real people out in the world and, and are different than you and are different than the computer for sure. And the computer cannot predict that human uh, behavior. And I tend to think that it never will. I mean, again, it's very dangerous to say AI will never be able to do this because right now we have very primitive AI. It really only started to becoming practical just a year ago. So we're in the early phases. It improves at a very, very rapid pace. And again, I, I kind of refer you to MidJourney, which is currently my favorite AI tool, which the image quality it's generating now is so much better than it did a year ago. And uh, we can predict it's gonna be even better next year. And and so we will definitely predict that it can also design maybe uh, good icons, which it cannot really do now. And there's a variety of other things we will imagine that these tools would be able to do for us in the future. So I, would, I do not say, whoa, AI will never be able to do X for most things because it's gonna improve. But, but for a few things, I do actually think that we can say AI will probably never be able to do this. And it's a little bit similar to this. We could say, well, AI will not be able to ma make a spaceship force that can fly faster than light because of, you know, the physics say that it's impossible to fly faster than light. I mean, science fiction says you can do it, right? But physics, science says you cannot do it. So assuming that those scientists are right, which of course, science always changes as they learn more. But if if that we continues to be be true, then no matter how good AI does, it cannot invent a spaceship that can travel faster than light because it's impossible. And similarly, even you take the best human, the best human user experience expert cannot predict everything about the, the user behavior. So we should not expect that even a better computer in the future would be able to do it because, because it's in the nature of things that are impossible. Not because AI is not good enough, it will get better but it can only get better in the area of things that are possible. It cannot get better in the area of things that are impossible. And, and this would be one of them. So the ability to really find out what people think and like and feel and behave, uh, that requires watching the actual customers. Awesome. Yes. Thank you very actual much. customers. Oh. We, we have a really uh, great question from uh... John Pagonis, and he's here with us. Would you like, John, would you like to unmute and ask uh, your question to Jacob? Yes, hello, Jacob. Uh, yeah. So I have this question for you, uh, going back to 93. So the mathematical model of the finding of usability problems that you and Landau published back then has been reviewed and validated numerous times and still stands true today. However, sometimes we hear arguments without evidence that this cannot be true because users are more diverse and technology is so much different these days. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I think it goes back to again that we observe empirically that this formula continues to work and has continued to work throughout a lot of different technologies and the user populations get bigger and bigger. They get into the millions or hundreds of millions of users for some products, maybe even a billion users for things like Facebook. I don't even really know how many they have these days, but it's big anyway. But the point is that when we're doing user testing, you know, we, we always tell the user, we are not studying you, we are studying the design. And that's actually true. It's not only, we say it partly to make them feel comfortable, but it's also because it's true. When we do user testing and the people say, oh, you shouldn't call it user testing because we're not testing the user. I say, I call it user testing because we're testing with users. We're using, we are employing the users to test the design. Anyway, that's a terminology issue, but, um, we're testing the design. And so we're probing the design. That's really what we're using these people for. We're using them to probe the design by using it in ways that we didn't think of because we have internal thinking because we're the ones who develop this product and we want to observe how representative customers use it. 
and there's not really that much variation in, I would say, kind of the, the, the big scheme of things. Now, if you want to talk about minute, small issues, yeah, everybody is different. And if you had a million people, they will probably do a million different things in the small details. But in the big kind of picture, which again, we're right now still in the phase where usability is a matter of removing the really terrible design elements. Um, those tend to be relatively uh, similar because they are a matter of the difference between machine and human, not between different this person and that person. Uh, those differences are there, but they are smaller compared to the big gap between person or humans and, and, and machines. And so that's, we're probing the machine, we're probing the design. And that's also why, you know, we don't actually really need huge sample sizes. I mean, there, there are two reasons we don't need huge sample sizes. And the one that the formula that you re, re, refer to that Tom Landau and I um, made up is that when you do a kind of repeat observations, you start seeing the same thing multiple time, times and you have a kind of a declining curve in terms of how much new you learn. You Every new user, you will learn something new, yes but you don't learn enough new. So that's kind of, that continues to be true. And I think anybody who actually does usability research will have observed this phenomenon that with the first user, you have like infinite new new knowledge because you have go from zero to something. But then with the second user, you already start seeing the same things again. And with the third user, even more so. And so the overlap with what new, what's new and what you already see, that overlap becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so that's what that formula says. And the formula is, of course, just a mathematical formula, and it depends on its parameters. And so one of the parameters in this formula is how much overlap there actually is. And it, it's, it still remains true that there's a rather substantial overlap in testing. When you add more users, you have a substantial overlap with the, with the previous users. And so the second reason that this works in practice, as opposed to just in mathematics, is that when we it, it really works for qualitative research for quantitative research there are more statistical other type of formulas but for qualitative research it doesn't actually matter how many times we've seen something because we are not trying to count because a count is irrelevant if you have five users if you have 10 users three out of 10 users or five out of 10 users it's 30 percent versus 50 percent but anybody who knows statistics also knows that there's so big a margin of error that is irrelevant whether it's three or five. It only matters there is a flaw in the user interface. So that's a qualitative insight. It's not a quantitative insight of how many users encounter this problem. It just means there is a problem. Then it's up to our expertise to judge whether or not improving the design, fixing that usability problem is worth it so we have to compare how much our judgment is of how bad it is with the engineering team's judgment of how much work it's gonna to take to fix it. And um, I say, yes, this is a judgment call. I am fine with making judgment calls because first of all, notice I just said, we compare our, our estimate with the engineering team's estimate. Well, they will always only have estimates of how much programming time is required to do anything. They will never know until it's done. How, how many hours of programmer time is actually required. So, so it's a cost benefit balance. And the one side of that balance is an estimate. So why can't the other side of the balance be an estimate as well? So I think it's completely fine that UX is based on judgment calls and estimates because it's, an, it's not an accurate science. It's a rough science. I mean, there's some science in it. There's some art in it. There's a lot of engineering in it. And it's all blends to being we aim at the best design we can do. We can never create the perfect design, but just the best we can do. And these things are all trade-offs because you can't have the developers create magic. They can only do so much work, you know? And, and so we have to balance these things off against each other. And therefore we have to make judgment calls. And our judgment calls, going back to the usability testing, if we do a qualitative study, it's a judgment call, how many users will be impacted by this problem. So all we're getting out of this, the, the, the study is we're getting aware that there is that issue, which we didn't think of before because we didn't know that users would do this weird thing that they actually do. Um, and that's why there are benefits to small scale usability studies. And the second th point is actually that no study hopefully stands alone. 
uh, the recommendation and my recommendation has always been to do a lot of research. And so the real point about this formula is actually to be used for another trade-off analysis, which is the trade-off between allocating your available budget and you always have so much money and no more. There's, you never have infinite money. It just doesn't exist in the world. So you only have a certain budget. How are you going to spend that budget, right? On one big study, on two smaller studies, on 10 even smaller studies, and so forth. And what the formula says is that the smaller the study, the higher the return on investment actually, uh, because you can do, let's say you do each study is 10% of your budget. Well, you do have, now you can do nine more studies after you change the design in iterative design. Or maybe you can do another study with another user group, for example. Like, let's say that uh, you are one of the very few companies that cares about accessibility and, and disabled users. And we know most companies don't, but if you do, right? then you could actually run a study. And now it's true because now it's a different user interface. Let's say you're, you are studying with blind users that have sighted users. So now you're studying the auditory user interface as opposed to the on-screen graphical user interface. Now that is a different design, even if it's the same backend, it's a different representation. And so therefore there will be different usability problems. And therefore that's a second study. Um, and so you, the more different studies you can do, the more your total learnings as opposed to uh, extremely exhaustive research with one particular thing. And you're right, if you have a hundred million users or a billion users, you're testing a very tiny minute fragment of them if you're running a study with five users. But that also doesn't matter because we're not doing an opinion poll, right? We're not trying to predict what people will vote at an election next month. We're trying to predict whether the user interface has an issue. And so we are testing the user interface. We're not testing the users. I mean, that's, we always tell people that, but I think it's it's the truth as well. Does, so does make any difference that we have modern users and modern technology to this formula? No, because they behave, I mean, people behave the same. People are the same as they've always been. And even though it's true that the technology is different, um, and therefore, it may have different usability problems than uh, than 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, but the general point about that once you've seen something one time and you see it a second time and a third time and a fifth time and a hundredth time, you see something for the 100th time and you don't, you're not any smarter. You don't know any more about the user interface. So, so that diminishing returns curve is really the point about uh, the formula for what you learn in user research that there's always a diminishing returns curve. And the reason that's a diminishing returns curve is because of the basic phenomenon that there's overlap. And so, yes, if we had the technology where there was no overlap, then um, the formula wouldn't, wouldn't work. If every, if every user did something 100% different than the previous user, then you would never learn any, then there would never be any overlap in, absurd, in in what you'd see with one user and what you see with another user. But that's also not the case. I mean, no technology is like that, that people use it hundred percent differently. Now, what you could argue is that there could be some technologies where people use it in more, in more different ways, I guess, that the differences are, are stronger than they used to be. In that case, the overlap would be smaller. In that case, that diminishing returns curve would diminish at a slower pace. That could absolutely be true. I just don't think that we we have those. It might be true for artificial intelligence actually because it creates a, a kind of a wider range of things that are possible with a given user interface. And so it's possible that there could be less overlap uh, between users. I have to say that the, the studies that I have, have watched of users using AI tools it seems to be working to me quite the same is that we see a lot of overlap. Once we get to like four or five users, we start seeing repeat behaviors. We start, oh yeah, this is what we already know. Here's another, we can see another check mark on that. Uh, so I feel like it's it seems to be about the same. It may not be exactly the same. It may be that the recommendation might change from testing five users to changing seven users or something like that. I don't know, but I don't think a recommendation would change being, oh, you got to change test a hundred users or you can't say anything about this tool. I I doubt that. That doesn't seem to be my experience from testing some of those tools that, that we have right now. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob.
Uh, we have a uh, Larry Marie uh, had another question. Larry, would you like to unmute and ask Jacob your yes. Hey, Jacob, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. 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 I'm here just to heckle you. So, but anyway, <laughs> um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about AI, and I've seen a lot of application of AI where it's more of a an add-on, a standalone add-on, glued on to existing solutions. Doesn't really integrate. Uh, into the uh, into the solution, but I've also seen cases where the AI is uh, dedicated to doing things that humans are not good at, but the machine is, and um, where it complements the user, so that you end up with a like a two part solution, human and, and machine, and they complement each other well. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I think you're you're, you're right, and it's probably because it's a very new area and it has as I mentioned before it's subjected to a lot of hype I think the I think AI is is a real advance and I think it has huge potential business potential for improving the world economy which is why I believe it's real but at the same time you also have this phenomenon that when something becomes this big this fast you get a lot of uh, kind of internal mandates in different companies to say, we need some of this as well, and we need it pronto, we need it right now, uh, as opposed to let's actually step back and think about how we can design new features, new tools with these new capabilities, which would take take longer time to achieve. And that's why you see some of that you know, kind of like bolted on in the side of an existing application, which is not uh, well integrated. It it's, may also be the same is true actually for the just human workflow as well, where we inject kind of a dose of AI in some of the things we do, and those things may improve by those 40% or maybe even more in some cases in productivity. But our overall work date does not improve by nearly as much because most of it is left untouched. And so what sort of old school human factors people would, would say is that we we should step back and look at the t the total workflow and we should redesign our our redesign our company space. And most companies probably only need half the staff they have now, and so and 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 doing very doing things in very different ways, and so that requires a lot of rethinking of how things are done. And that's not something that happens in one year. I mean, organizational change takes decades. But similarly, going thinking just only about the software design, I mean, like really designing a, a good software application for something kind of more fundamental uh, is also something that that takes a while to do. And so I, th I think this, it's actually, I mean, we can be pejorative and say negative bad things about this idea of bolting on an AI feature on the side. Uh, it's certainly not what should be done in, in an ideal world. It's not how we would expect the tools to be in 10 years. But on the other hand, it is a way to get some experience now with some of the things that work and don't work. And I think we're going to see some things that don't work because people are just rushing to let's just try some stuff. And yeah, I see it. It, like it doesn't said, work. Yeah. Like you said, companies uh, are real quick to try to slap a little AI onto their existing product. And that, that will often not be a great idea. But then every now and then it will be. Every now and then it will discover, oh, wow, this feature actually is a good idea. Uh, it's a little bit similar to this notion of just adding adding AI power chat to a website. I mean, you, you want to rethink what you're doing on the internet based on the new capability of individualizing the interface to the specific individual customer and not just have a lot of you know, chat going back and forth and people... Going back to this articulation barrier, people having to articulate in writing and prose what they want, as opposed to clicking on being shown options for what they might want, which is much easier. So a lot of those those uh, designs can probably be be different once they've been thought through, as opposed to the I can just like open a channel back to to um, GPT and and pass tokens back and forth, and you create a simple simple chat add-on. Uh, so what what people do quickly bolted on is not what should be done. It's not what will be done in the long run. It may give us some some uh, nice insights into some of the more useful versus less useful. And again, I go back to like useful. I mean, certainly I want usability, which is you know my 
love. I want things to be usable, and that's a hugely important design element, but it also has to be useful. I mean, those are the two things that combine to create utility. Uh, so it has to do something useful for people. And um, some of these AI ideas will be very useful, and some others will, will not. I mean, we have already examples of things that are useful, which is why I think it's a real advance. But there's also going to be a lot of experimentation that fails. And this is in many ways okay because that's the nature of experiments. If they, you know, if if you if you don't have some failed experiments, you were not aggressive enough. That's kind of one of the old old school sayings. But I really believe that that's true. So um, yeah, so I feel like that that it is really early days. It's honestly about a year since uh Chat DPT came out with like version four, which was the kind of the, the good one. So that's very, very little time. And it takes more time than that to really do a kind of good, good, uh, good UX design. So it, it'll be a little while before we see. And then it takes even longer to, to redesign our workflows and companies and redesign the entire company uh, to behave in the more more optimal manner. So I think a lot of those will be very, very different. I think, by the way, this is going to happen in the the UX field as well, because um, you know we have this added productivity, which is really great. We also have this added upskilling. You know, one of the things we've learned from the early AI experiences is that AI uh, narrow skill gaps, so it becomes possible for people with less education and training and experience to perform better on a wider range of tasks. And so this, I I, I kind of think that this um, creates more um, power to the broader skilled UX person as opposed to the narrow skilled person. It also probably creates a broader uh, set of uses of our approaches in companies, which may actually lead to fewer um, kind of big UX departments. So I feel like, like um, in the past, we've seen companies grow bigger and bigger and bigger UX departments with more and more levels of management and you know, UX directors, UX vice presidents, and so forth. And uh, I'm, they, that may not be so much in the future. There may not be these uh, people who are like the VP of UX and in charge of the 500 design designers or something like that. That may not happen so much. It may be more distributed. It may be smaller teams. It may be people who have other titles who do part, some of their, their job, they do, do, do UX because now they can do it with support of these AI tools that upskill them. So so I read in the Wall Street Journal, they had a, interviewed a guy from a company that had been, had been try, experimenting with more AI support for the team. And so, they, so he said that it's a seniority booster. So it's like, it takes you on my entry-level staff and they can now do mid-level uh, you know, tasks. The people who are mid-level can now do senior level uh, work and so forth. So like you you upskill uh, people's ability to to do work, which flattens out, you know, the, the, these, these hierarchies. And um, whether you like or not, do not like that, if you sort of have your dream, you want to be like the UX VP in charge of 500 people, those jobs may not exist so much in the future or like big specialized UX companies. Like we always see, see IDEO cut in half. I would not be surprised if over the next 10 years they're cut in half again, not to say anything bad about them. I hope they survive, you know, it's a good company. But I think that specialized UX companies may also not be long for, long for this world, other than like small boutique, you know, five person teams and things like that. But I feel like it's going to be a lot of flattening out that will happen because of this upskilling that we're going to see that, that the powerful tool, the more powerful tools they are really they're they are forklift for the mind. AI is a forklift for the mind. It makes us better. It's Doug Inkelbart's old idea, you know, with um, augmenting the human intellect that he talked about for so many, many years. You know, Doug Inkelbart is mostly famous for you know inventing the the computer mouse, but um, that was not his real project. His real project was augmenting the human intellect, but it never worked in his days very well. But now it does. So now we have AI that's uplifting our our intellectual capabilities, because it's, it's similar to when I say that it's a forklift for the for the mind. It's similar to like the actual physical forklift helps you know warehouse workers they don't have to be like super strong people who can carry big heavy boxes anymore. The forklift will carry a box for you, right? So you can have uh, less muscular people work in the warehouse these days. And similarly, AI takes the cognitive burden and uplifts some of that for us. And I really feel that this is will be changing dramatically a lot of how work is organized. Not so much right now. Right now, we are injecting it in a very specific, okay, I can make a picture. No, I can make 
50 pictures in like two minutes and then I can pick one, one I want to use and so on. So yeah, those are small, interesting advances. Ide you know, gives us more ideation, allows us more creativity. So AI can actually be very, a great creativity booster, but I feel like the work, the work change, the organizational changes, and that'll be another 10 years coming, but I, I feel those are going to be enormous. Well, I share your enthusiasm and optimism, and I actually have a chapter in my book, which I'm sure you haven't read yet, uh, on the UX of AI, and I describe pretty much what you just did, but not as articulate as you did. So thank you. I appreciate your comments on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Jacob. Do we have time for uh, one last question? Nikos, Nikos Papas has a question uh, from the chat. Because would you like to unmute and ask Jacob yourself? Yes, of course. Hi, Jacob. Hi, everyone. Hi. So um, it's interesting how many times we are, we have already said or written a uh, real user to distinguish you know, people from the AI engines. And it's similar to how we used to describe uh, internal stakeholders actually doing research, participating in research uh pretending to be the real user so this makes me wonder why we keep trying to replace doing research with the real real users humans <laughs> with substitutes um what's the benefit there what why we keep doing this yeah i mean that's a good question because i think that the the results are definitely superior if you uh watch your real customers representative members of your target audience and and uh but i think it is very compelling to say we don't have to do that i mean it is it's it's com anytime you can say i don't have to do something it's compelling i'm like if somebody made you know like chocolate that uh, was slimming instead of being fattening i would i would eat it you know the problem is that it doesn't exist so uh and it's similar in this case so Things that sound compelling don't actually have to be compelling, and those are those are just two different things. Whether whether it sounds good or whether it works are two separate points, and uh, it's it's just very um, tempting for people to believe that design is something that can be judged, I guess, in some sense more easily, because you have to have this first recogn recognition that we need user-friendly design. That was something that was a 50 years ago kind of insight, but not everybody has, still not everybody has that. But assuming that you want to have user-friendly user design, then does that then lead you to user-centered design? That's sort of a leap of, of insight there. And that insight has been had over those 50 years by basically everybody who has tried it has uh, discovered that we cannot make things that are actually good for users without watching users use the product. So this this lesson has been learned over and over and over again, but it sounds very tempting that all we have to do is to make a decision to make something easy. And then because we, and I say we, that would be like the people on the product team, whether it's the product manager or the engineer or anybody, well, they are all people themselves. They're all humans themselves. And so therefore, they certainly have the ability to judge whether the design is good or bad for, for, for people. We have to put a big asterisk on that statement because it will be for people like themselves. So other programmers, and those do not tend to be the target audience. And that's the insight that we have had who have actually done the observational research. We've noticed how people, sort of normal people behave very, very differently than the people who are on the product team. And so my go-to statement is really that I, I tell them, you are too smart, you know too much, and therefore you cannot judge what's easy or difficult for the average people who are more average than you and who don't, and particularly don't know as much about your product, about your company, about your domain usually. I mean, so, so there's a lot that people know who are on the product team, they know so much more than the normal users do. And uh, because it's a kind of a flattering thing to say that you're too smart and you know too much, um, it's something that is an argument that's a little bit better chance, I guess, of, of penetrating these people. 
uh, of this recognition that there's a difference between the people in the design team and the people using the product. But unless you have somebody to make that argument, right, then it becomes the logical, simple conclusion that, yes, we want user-friendly design, but that doesn't mean it has to be user-centered design. It just means that we have to make the decision that we want to make it good for good. And we are people, our humans ourselves, so therefore we can make that decision. It just turns out that they cannot, but um, it's it's an understandable conclusion, I have to say. It's, it's understandable why people would think that way. So we have to explain to them why that thinking does not work. Thank you for the very interesting answer. Thanks a lot. Uh, instead, instead of an outro, I'd like to ask you a, a very small, more personal question, trying to merge a lot of comments we got. 41 years uh, spanning academia, Bell Communication Research, Bell Core, some microsystems, I think I got this in order, and uh, Nielsen Normal Group, and then one day, Jacob's Liberation. No more companies, no more clients, you said. Uh, yes. We have to ask, why liberty? Why tigers? What are your next steps? Yes. Well, that's a that's a great point. I mean, I I feel like I'm a little bit burned out in in running running business, and um, I want to get back to my kind of roots, which is really this point about like what how to make you know, design better, how to make you know technology better for humans, and so in some sense, like liberating myself from the from the business angle has in fact been been great. And I'm, I can also sort of say things that I maybe offense a few people, I don't know, but I don't have to worry about that because, well, if people don't like me, they can unsubscribe from my newsletter and I'll refund them what they paid, which is zero dollars and zero cents. You know, it's a free newsletter. So if people don't like me, they don't have to read me. Uh, so that is, whereas in contrast, if you're on a business, you know, you, you have to like, oh, you know, you can't say certain, certain things. So I think it's very, very liberating. Um, I feel like I, there's actually really two really main goals I have uh, going forward. And, and one is the same goal I've actually always had, which is to make technology uh, subservient to humanities and promote, uh, promote humans and, and to be in charge of computers and technology. And so that's the same I've actually always, always uh, wanted to do. And that's why I have done all these things like the heuristics and the discount usability to make it practical and make it work. I just want to push that sort of more aggressively, I guess, guess now. Uh, and the second one is a more sort of narrow focus. I have some some people I'm mentoring and we want to like help help them advance as well. It's not so much help myself advance because I did that already. I've done all, I've just basically, I've done all the type of things, have so many patents, have so many uh, research papers, did an extremely successful business. Now, maybe the world is changing. And it's going to be harder to run a you know, UX specific business uh, because of this broadening. And I feel like in many ways, that means that I have, I have a victory in what I really want to achieve, which is to immerse this user-centered thinking throughout the economy throughout everybody, all companies doing everything. And so in the past, you had all these companies being uh, UX clients. They had to go out to companies like, you know, the one I, I used to have uh, to get advice on how to do better design. Now they're UX doers. You know, they can do it themselves. And that's what I've always tried to promote, make discount usability, make it easier so that people can do it themselves. Um, they don't have to go and hire uh, you know, a consulting company to, to do it for them. Uh, people can learn on their own. You know, I'm very, very keen on mentoring. I'm also a big supporter of places like ATP List, where you can go and get uh, and both mentor and be mentored. So that one-on-one -on -one connection, I think, is a really, really powerful thing going forward. So those are things that I'm very strongly in favor of: is making you know technology more suited for 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 humans, and that has been my my lifelong you know project really, and that's still not done. I think we've come a very long way in those 40 year, 41 years I have worked on it and other people have worked on it, obviously, too. And that proves to me that you know, UX works. It can actually make technology better for, for humanity. Um, it's still only maybe about 20% there, I would say, compared to where it should be. But 20% is a much more than maybe the 1% of the way it was when I started, where computers were really terrible. So it's come a long way. And my goal now is really just to push and i'm not going to you know live long enough to see the last 80 percent happening because that may be another 100 years but i feel like it's on that path and just push accelerate on that path is really what i'm pushing that's also why i'm doing a lot of, of you know like the 
my have my 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 email newsletter you can subscribe for free you know uh, and if you don't like it you'll get it for free back <laughs> but that's all i can say so i'm pushing i'm pushing and um so i i had that focus and i have the second focus on on mentoring and 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 helping some of the the new talent there's so much exciting new talent in in the ux field as well it's grown so much you know there are three million ux people in the world right now is my estimate and over the next 10 years we're going to go to about 10 million this means seven million new people are going to enter the field over the next 10 years so helping them is one of my my big goals as well mr nielsen or jacob i'm confused uh a big applause for what you have done in this domain all these years we are incredibly thankful for your time today. A massive uh, thank you once more. We are thrilled to have you today in the UX Quiz community. And we hope that we will have like a new opportunity to have a year with us uh, in the near future. Uh, a big thank you to everyone for preparing and giving your questions and participating in this discussion. In uh, any way, we have so many questions. So let's continue our discussions uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, for everyone to uh, switch on their cameras and like have like a brief uh, screenshot with Jacob all together. Uh, so if you want to be in that screenshot, let's open the cameras and uh, Dimitris, can you just uh, have some screenshots? Okay, so uh, uh... everyone? Yes, Hans? Everyone? <laughs> Just give us a little bit of time, guys, because we're nine pages long. <laughs> <laughs> Some noise. Yay. No? No noise? Okay, fair enough. The <laughs> British are okay? No, 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 a little bit more. <laughs> we have a nice big audience. <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Great, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, just don't forget, uh, post any question on LinkedIn. Uh, use the hashtags UXGuys in the next four hours in order to uh, catch some gifts. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors from Scratch Studio, Zancy Labs, the UX Prodigy, and Evidence Based. Uh, Stay tuned for upcoming events. Uh, we have a new website, UXGuys.community, and you can see the recording in uh, the UX Greece channel uh, on YouTube. And of course, join the UX Greece community on LinkedIn uh, to get all the updates. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thanks, thanks again once more for everything. Thank See you, you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.